So good evening. Uh, we have a lot to get through, and I need a sense of whether we have a quorum. It does seem that the room is pretty full, so I'm going to say we do. So. Welcome to this meeting for the board of the InGen Corporation held here at JSConf US. I've spoken to a few of you, but for others who I haven't met yet, my name is Haley Denbraver, and I've been hired to analyze the failures that occurred during the incident at Isla Nublar. Um, so I know this is currently a rough time for many of you, and that there's maybe some uncertainty about the project moving forward. And that's why I'm here. I was hired to review the recent incident and to catalog the points of failure and to suggest some next steps for the project. So I'm going to talk to you today. There's going to be four parts, all right? And first, we're going to review the events of the weekend so we can all be working from the same set of facts. Second, I'm going to dive into the flaws within our design workflow. Now, this isn't going to be about failures within the code itself, but it's more about our process and our practice of software engineering. Third, we're going to discuss engineering ethics and uh, look into how ethical breaches compromise this project. And finally, I'm going to cover the idea of chaos engineering, and I'm going to suggest some steps that we could take to build a more resilient Jurassic Park. I really want to be on the same page with everyone uh, with respect to the events of the weekend. So we're going to do a quick review now. So hands up, can you tell me if you've read the written account of the failure at Jurassic Park? All right, I see a few hands, that's good. Uh, what about those who viewed the video footage? Okay, more, that's good. All right, so that helps. Uh, as those who are familiar with both can attest, there are a number of discrepancies between the two accounts, right? <laughs> and from my research, it's clear to me that the video footage provides the most accurate account, so that's what we're gonna go with. First, let's meet our consultants. Dr. Grant is a paleontologist, and he works with his postdoc, Dr. Sadler, who's a paleobotanist. Dr. Ian Malcolm has a PhD in mathematics, and he's an expert in something called chaos theory. He details this as the idea that systems are really complex and that they're likely to behave in unpredictable ways, even when small changes or flaws are introduced. Relevant staff members include John Hammond, who's the creator of the park, Dennis Nedry, who was the lead software developer for Jurassic Park, Dr. Wu, who's the head scientist, Robert Muldoon, who was our game warden. John Arnold, who was our chief engineer. And Donald Gennaro, who was our chief counsel. All right, so now that we know the team, let's discuss the events. After a construction worker was killed in an accident, Grant, Sadler, and Malcolm were brought to the park to render their professional opinions. Malcolm was aware of the nature of the park from the beginning and was consistently against the project. He was convinced that the park would never work because of chaos theory, and we're going to discuss that more later. Grant and Sadler were unaware of the true nature of the park. They thought it was something more akin to a museum. Uh, but they were initially surprised and delighted by the dinosaurs. While this visit was taking place, Dennis Nedry was on site to take care of software bugs. We've since learned that he was unhappy with the terms of his contract. Uh, a while back, he was approached by a competitor who wanted to open a similar park and wasn't above bribing Nedry to steal some embryos, to which Nedry agreed. During the park visit, there was a significant storm while some of our people were on a tour of the park. 
and a number of systems went down, some the result of the storm and others because Nedry had purposely brought them down in order to execute his plan. Most notably, the electric fences went down. Nedry died while trying to get the embryos to his handler and was not able to resolve either the purposeful software vulnerabilities that he had included to execute his plan or the multitude of software bugs that were there anyway. Grant discovered that some of the dinosaurs had been breeding, even though this was supposed to be impossible because we had made sure that all of the dinosaurs are female. Uh, geneticist Dr. Wu used frog DNA to fill in the holes in the genetic code and uh, apparently certain species of frogs can change sex when in a single sex environment in order to continue the species. Or as Malcolm puts it, life finds a way. While Grant and others were evading raptors, Dr. Sadler, with the help of Muldoon and Arnold, was able to manually reboot the power and Hammond's granddaughter was able to get the computer up and running again because she knows Unix. This success, <laughs> this success came at a high cost because both Muldoon and Arnold were lost in the effort. And they weren't the only ones. During this incident, we lost Nedry, Muldoon, Arnold, and Gennaro, and we also lost the uh, construction worker previously. There were also many, many close calls. God, we have a lot of hiring to do. Check the website, okay? <laughs> the remaining team members with various injuries and traumas were able to escape once the storm had cleared, and the T-Rex and the Velociraptors were keeping each other busy. And this brings the relevant events to a close. All right, so now that we're all on the same page, let's talk about software engineering at Jurassic Park. John Hammond claims that he spared no expense in the creation of this park. But this really isn't the case. The resort is luxurious, and yes, genetic engineering is pricey, but I've determined through my research that we drop the ball in terms of software. And we're gonna explore some of those pitfalls. In this section, I'm gonna be nice to Nedry, but I have harsh words for him later. From the evidence I've gathered, it's, it's even hard to believe this, but it was clear that Nedry did not know he was writing software for a dinosaur park. Instead, I discovered that the requirements he had been given included vague instructions like, write software that will dispense food at pre-recorded times. Write software to monitor a series of electric fences. Write software to visually scan the area and report back. Nedry eventually figured out what the software was for, and he had his suspicions confirmed by our competitors. But he should have been in from the first, and if we didn't trust him to be in from the first, then we should have hired someone else, even if that would have cost more. Hammond was trying to be competitive by keeping his plans under wraps, but he was setting himself up for failure by not giving his software development team critical information. In addition to not telling Nedry what the software's for, an unrealistic timeline was enforced. There was scope creep, insufficient budgeting. For instance, Nedry tried to get more money to fix problems, but was threatened with retaliation. And when the scope creeps and the budget is blown, how much testing do you think really happens and what critical features do you think are deemed good enough? Now, don't get me wrong. All code has bugs and problems. Everyone, you know, no one's perfect and everyone has their share of flaws and a project can always be improved. But not perfect code is a far cry from poorly designed, poorly documented, untested code running in a production environment that includes velociraptors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
All right, so it's clear that we didn't approach uh, the design of Jurassic Park in a way to best ensure the success and safety of the project. But I also want to discuss the breaches in ethical practice that occurred because they're undoubtedly a cause of the problem as well. So who here has heard of the Hippocratic Oath? Lots of people, okay, good. It's a pledge doctors give, and it says to first do no harm. So who here has heard of doctors, lawyers, or engineers? And when I say engineers here, I mean like a structural engineer, a mechanical engineer, someone who's licensed. Who here has heard of someone like that uh, either losing their license or being fined or prosecuted for unethical behavior? That happens too. The reason it happens is that doctors and lawyers and engineers, they're accountable for their professional behavior in order to protect the people that they serve. Certain aspects of the conception and design of Jurassic Park, and uh, even specifically to the software, it caused a lot of harm to the public and it should be viewed as a failing in ethical practice. Whether this means uh, will be held to account or not uh, remains to be seen. Nedry is clearly guilty of unethical behavior. He introduced flaws into his system to exploit for his own personal gain. He accepted bribes to steal another's property. He purposely wrote code so that it would be difficult for someone else to debug it and reboot it and expose his malfeasance. What he did was illegal, immoral, unethical, and directly led to the deaths of himself and others. And I think it would be easy to focus on Nedry and his shortcomings because he's a contractor and he's not part of our main org chart, right? And he's also dead. <laughs> but I can't let InGen and its representatives off the hook either. If we think of breaches in engineering ethics to only include things like sabotage and bribery, we, we miss the larger picture. Malcolm, our infuriating and unapologetic consultant, was right. We thought about whether we could create this park and we never considered whether we should. Malcolm was of the opinion that the park could never be safe. And while we could debate the merit of that position, it's clear that the potential for harm was much higher than originally portrayed by some of our higher ups. In the interest of financial gain, corners were cut, uh, which resulted in de decreased safety, and that's unacceptable. Ethical breaches have consequences, and in our case, it resulted in a handful of deaths, some other injuries and traumas, and financial loss to a number of parties. And it could have been a lot worse. I mentioned at the start that I have an interest in engineering ethics. And this is true, and I could tell you that it comes from me being just a really excellent person, but it's not the case. If I put my business hat on, I still care about this stuff. And the reason is that I'm interested in engineering ethics because I am interested in resilient software systems. Ethical breaches have the capacity to compromise a system. And that's precisely what happened in this case with respect to Nedry and with respect to InGen. Ethical breaches are a source of chaos. They are unexpected and their results are unpredictable. Training in and the application of engineering ethics should never be considered what our industry sometimes calls soft skills, but rather they should be viewed as something that has the capacity to make or break your system. My final point of discussion is about chaos engineering. As we've seen, InGen system experienced a high degree of chaos in the form of 
unethical behavior, fragile system design, and simple bad luck. The storm compounded problems, for instance. If the board decides to move forward with rebuilding and reinvesting in the park, I believe that chaos engineering should be employed as part of the system design. But what is chaos engineering? Well, chaos engineering is the practice of breaking your system on purpose, observing how the failure propagates through the system, and documenting how the team was able to respond to the problem, and then refactoring to fix that. This is essentially what happened on Isla Nublar, uh, but minus the on purpose part. So how do we approach this? First recommendation. Break things on purpose, but don't start with production. Break a dev instance, see what happens, and how your team responds. Release a hypothetical Velociraptor before you release a, a real one. And it's not to say that you can't move to prod eventually, but uh, let's start with dev. Second recommendation is to start small and iterate. Break something small, make a prediction of what will happen, see what actually does, resolve the incident, and then refactor to prevent the propagation of the failure that was observed. Then break something else and repeat. Train your staff on incident response so they aren't scrambling to figure out how to turn on the generator or say how to reboot the electric fence. A final point to provide perspective. Another term for chaos engineering is failure injection. It might be weird to think of something that includes the word failure as a positive thing. So if that trips you up, I would say that you should focus on the word injection and think of chaos engineering as a vaccine. Something bad, whether it's viral proteins, dead or attenuated viruses, a software bug, is injected into a supposedly healthy system. The system responds, addresses the issue, and then retains the ability to address the problem when it's encountered another time. It becomes stronger by being exposed. Upon reviewing the events, it became very important to me to talk both about engineering ethics and about chaos. I really think that these ideas reinforce each other, especially for systems that are critical. It could be argued that we have an ethical responsibility to build resilient systems, especially when the human cost of failure is high. Additionally, the ethical practice of software engineering, well, it removes an element of chaos from the system. Things may still go wrong, but from mistake and not malice. It's my opinion that any further progress on Jurassic Park should go forward with these two ideas as its base, or it shouldn't go forward at all. So how do we use these ideas to build a better park? I wanna close my talk with the following recommendations. Recommendation one, appropriately budget resources to software design and testing. Number two, increase transparency between stakeholders. No surprises. Three, hire professionals you can trust. Listen to them and make sure they have the necessary resources. And hire enough people. Don't discount your staff. Jurassic Park had initially been designed to not require a lot of people, but better software or automated software doesn't negate your need for well-trained capable staff. Number four, to build a better park, use the principles of chaos engineering to refine your design well before there are actual velociraptors running around. And finally, number five, maybe just don't. As Malcolm, <laughs> yeah, maybe just don't. As Malcolm puts it, this park might have been doomed from the start. The stakes are too high and nature is just too complex. Ask yourself whether you should, not just whether you can. All right, so it's time to call the question. 
Who here on the board votes to restart and reinvest in Jurassic Park? I want to see a show of hands. Yeah? Okay. And how many want to kill the project? Show of hands. Okay. The lights are kind of strong, so uh, I may be wrong here, but uh, I feel like the majority want to reinvest. So, um, so the project is restarted, and may God have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> now, uh, if you'll allow me a minute, I'd really like to dress you as myself and not in character. So thank you so much to the JS Conf US team for having me and my talk for this conference. It was a real pleasure. Uh, my real job, I don't actually work for InGen is as a developer advocate at Sneak, and it's my job to get feedback from devs and to learn about the challenges that they face and to help them out. So if you ever want to talk open source and security, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. Uh, you can see my email on the screen, uh, and my Twitter handle is there too, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'll also be posting these slides at that Twitter handle as soon as I can. Um, so you can check that out if you're interested, and I'll probably drop a link in the Slack as well. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about security, you can uh, join a vendor-neutral security education-focused group that I help run uh, called the Secure Developer. We do virtual events, and we have a Slack group, and uh, there's also a podcast that I think is really good. So check that out if you're interested. Now, I wanted to do one more thing. And uh, because I was so excited to give this talk, and because I'm a local and I didn't have to drag a bunch of stuff through the airport, um, <laughs> uh, we're going to do some trivia. And it includes some prizes uh, for those that get the answers right. So in 1993, I was in elementary school. And we were ignored if we spoke uh, without raising our hands and being called on. So that's how I'm going to operate here, and you've been warned. Uh, additionally, this is 1993, so you wouldn't be able to Google stuff, and you definitely wouldn't have a phone that connects to the internet. So uh, play fair, OK? All right, so our first question is, what had Dr. Grant and Dr. Sadler discovered at their dig sites at the opening of the movie? Any hands? Uh, front table. Mosquito and amber? Oh, nope, that's not it. <laughs> Red hat. <laughs> um, that is close enough. <laughs> it was a uh, velociraptor fossil of a baby velociraptor. Come get your prize. <laughs> that was an infant velociraptor fossil. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so a retrofitted can of shaving cream is used by Nedry. Oh, see, I don't pay attention when people don't raise their hands and are called on. All right, <laughs> so what brand is it? Hands, please. Um, let's see, a guy in the gray sweater in the middle. Barbasol. <laughs> That's right, come claim your prize. <laughs> Yay. All right. This one I really like, and I want to see hands not yelling. So which of the following is a dinosaur? Um, let's see. Uh, let's go with um, the girl. I think she's wearing red. Did you raise your hand tentatively? Yeah. Which, one's not a, which one is a dinosaur? Um, which one do you mean? Uh, so the, the one that's flying? Or which one? <laughs> the what? The flying one? No, that is not a dinosaur. Um, down front, here. The penguin is a dinosaur. No, really, I read this in a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, 
Um, so the pterodactyl was a really good guess, and it coexisted with the dinosaurs, um, but it was actually a flying lizard. Um, whereas uh, the general scientific consensus right now is that birds are not only related to dinosaurs, but they're a branch of dinosaurs. And so people will sometimes call them avian dinosaurs. And they're still here today, so that's pretty cool. Um, so come get your prize. <laughs> All right, yay. So we have our penguin. All right, and finally, the fictional island of Isla Nublar is located off the coast of what country? Um, let's see, uh, you're in the white shirt there. Costa Rica, that's right. Come claim your prize. <laughs> all right, so now it's over. Thanks again to all the organizers and especially for how inclusive and thoughtful they were with um, things like captioning and childcare. I had a really great time and I hope you did too. So thank you so much, JSConf US.